Welcome back to the show where we run you through all the Dolphins news you need to know about. After running through the news you need to know about, we run you through the fan Q&A where we answer fans' questions. This first news story comes from Pro Football Rumors, and I'm pretty sure we didn't do this last week, but if I did, I apologize. Very slow in news, obviously. Sports is pretty much dead as it's ever been. So obviously the news is going to be a little bit slow. But this first news story comes from Pro Football Rumors. And it's the latest on Dolphins linebacker Raekwon McMillan. The Dolphins haven't ruled out an extension for Raekwon McMillan, Barry Jackson of the Miami Herald hears. It's likely that the linebackers' negotiations, like many around the NFL, have been held up due to the pandemic and uncertainty about the 2021 NFL salary cap. However, Jackson hears the Dolphins appreciate what McMillan brings to the table and they'd be interested in continuing his stay. So, just a really nice update on Raekwon. Obviously, his rookie contract's almost up. We're going to have enough cap space if we want to extend him. Um, obviously, we expect the salary cap to go up. If everything was normal, it would have went up. Obviously, after the CBA and stuff like that, uh, it should go up. But, um, obviously, with the pandemic, we don't know how fans are going to get into stadiums. That kind of income could be drastically decreased because of that so who knows what the salary cap is going to look like next year but if all does go well and i think we're all hoping all goes well um and hopefully goes better than we actually think it will then i don't see any issue resigning raekwon and you guys you know i've talked about raekwon many times and i think obviously his rookie season he tore his acl got off to kind of a rough start there I think he's underrated as a three-down guy. I don't think he's as bad, excuse me, in coverage as some people might. I mean, he's not great. He's not Jerome Baker. You know, he's not a top-end guy by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but he's a really good, instinctual, versatile linebacker that's really, really physical and really good against the run. Great tackler. Um, Makes a lot of underrated plays last year. He put some pressure on the quarterback at times. Made a lot of stops in the backfield and big times and big downs in the game. Had a great game against the Jets. Um, that kind of goes under the radar. And just really has not had a very solid start to his career. If this was like 2005, you know, I feel like this he's, you know, obviously going to be a three-down guy. He's one of the better linebackers in the league. Obviously, the game has changed a lot. And you kind of got to use him in certain situations and a little bit sparingly. Uh, but I feel like he could be our Dante Hightower where he, not necessarily the greatest in coverage, but that's not how you really want to use him. You know, you move him inside, move him outside, and that's a lot what we did last year. We moved him inside, moved him outside, and he did a great job any time we moved him to outside linebacker. And he actually graded out as our um, pro football focuses. Uh, he was our best defensive player. Uh, if, I don't know how much stock you guys put into that. I don't put very much into it because I would disagree with that, that he was our best defensive player last year. I think... I think Jerome Baker was probably our best and most consistent defensive player. But Raekwon, I feel like, under the radar, a very solid player for us. And I think his role is going to be expanded. And I wouldn't be surprised if he did get extended next year. Uh, like I said, he could be used like a Dante Howard, t Howard type, where you do a lot of different things. And obviously, if you don't... I mean, I'm sure you guys know Dante Howard, Dante Hightower's game. Not the greatest in coverage. Very similar to, like, a C.J. Mosley, but obviously Dante's a lot more versatile, and I feel like the same. And I think Raekwon, to be honest with you, is more athletic than both of those guys. Um, and he might not be as strong as Dante Hightower, um, and he might not be the pass rusher that Dante could be, um, but he is very much a similar type of player that can be used in that particular way. So I, I think I like his game going forward, especially in this system. So moving on from that, um, that was all the pro football f rumors news. We have some other rumors that I want to get to. Um, and this next rumor is the Chris Jones situation. So if you guys don't know, Chris Jones has been heavily rumored to be traded. And I think those rumors sparked up recently. So I wanted to talk about it, and one of the landing spots that everybody has him going to uh, is the Dolphins, and I wanted to talk about that as well. Um, so just to read you some of his stats, because I feel like Chris Jones goes kind of under the radar as one of the better defensive players in the NFL. Not a lot of people talk about him. Obviously, an all-pro caliber player, made an all-pro team, obviously has a Super Bowl, Pro Bowls, all that stuff. So he's, he's a great player. Uh, so his stats here... 
And by the way, one of the best, best interior pass rushers that we have in the league. Uh, in 2018, he had 15 and a half sacks at defensive tackle from a traditional defensive tackle position as well, which is pretty crazy. Um, and, well, they move him inside and outside, so I guess it's not all from the inside, uh, to be fair on that one. And he only played 11 games in 2018, and he had 15 sacks, which is crazy. Um, those were games started. Uh, so it'll say 16 games. We only play, he only started 11 of those games due to injury. Um, uh, and then 2019, his most recent season. Sorry for the pauses there. Uh, he had nine sacks uh, and only started 12 games. Played 13. Had another couple injuries there um, that kind of hampered his stats. But again, another pretty much a double-digit sack season back to back. Uh, in those two years, uh, he hit the quarterback 49 times, which is pretty crazy. Uh, in his career, he's had 72 quarterback hits. So most of his production has come in the last two years. He has 33 career sacks. And obviously, like I said, he's a first-team All-Pro. He's a Pro Bowler, one of the best players in the National Football League. But I, I feel like his name doesn't get picked up enough. And um, so, you know, maybe for more common people who mainly watch Dolphins football, maybe don't watch more games than, uh, like, a hardcore fan would, he's one of the best players in the league. And... Um, one of the best interior pass rushers, second to only Aaron Donald, in my opinion. I think Fletcher Cox is a close third when it comes to pass rushing. Uh, you know, DeForest Buckner's up there, but I don't think he's as good as them. Um, Eric Armstead of the 49ers, he doesn't have the pass rushing prowess those guys do. He's ca- he's kind of a one-move guy, and he kind of benef- benefited a lot of the time because he was the worst player on that defensive line uh, when you talk about Buckner, Ford, Bosa and Armstead. I feel like Armstead was probably the weakest link in terms of pass rush. Uh, so a lot of the time he, you know, got a lot of one on ones. Um, I don't know why I'm bringing up Armstead, but the point is, is um, you know, Chris Jones in a heavily, a heavy pass, excuse me, a heavy pass league. One of the best pass rushers in the NFL, and especially where he rushes the passer from, which is at the defensive tackle spot. And a year before um, Spagnola got there. Obviously, they switched defensive coordinators from 2018 to 2019. The year before that, he played defensive end and defensive tackle in a 3-4 system. They moved to a more multiple front type of a deal, but he mainly played left defensive tackle. Um, so, And he still had nine sacks, and he's doing that from an interior position, which is the hardest position to rush the passer from. But if you're really successful at it, um, you could do the most damage from that position. Uh, an NFL game, so he has a very. First of all, it's a very rare gift to have. Not especially if you look at NFL history. Very few players have been able to do that in general, and especially on a consistent basis. Uh, be a double digit sack guy from the interior. It's very difficult to do. Um, one of the hardest things you can do in football, uh, and he's really good against the run as well. He's two way player. Underrated player, athletic for his size, like he's very quick. I could not say enough about Chris Jones. He's a great player. I, you know, when I look at some of the possible trades out there right now, we think about David and Joku, Jamal Adams, uh, now Chris Jones. I think Chris is the best player out of all of those guys. Um, he's obviously the oldest out of those guys, uh, but he's in his prime right now, and he's still a young player. Was drafted in 2016. He hasn't been in the league that long, um, and uh, just an absolute monster. So, if I was the Dolphins, I obviously and I know it was rumored for a while that you know we were heavily favored to, to uh, make the deal. I'm all for it. If the Dolphins decide to do it, to add that kind of a player, who is really what we want Christian Wilkins to become. I don't know if he'll ever. I don't think he's ever going to be the athlete that Chris Jones is because Chris Jones is such a special athlete. But that's kind of, we want some of that with, obviously, Wilkins. And to have that kind of a game wrecker in the middle. Now, you know, we had, in those two years that were career years, first-team All-Pro years, has had some injury issues, but both years played over 10 games, started over 10 games, which is, that's all I need from you. As long as you're giving me 11 to 12 games a year, that's fine. And if you're a superstar, you know, that's even better. Um, you know, so I, I don't think that's going to be much of an issue. So yeah, if the Dolphins had to make any move right now, and I would press the button for it, I think Jamal Adams fits a huge hole. 
um, that the Dolphins need. So I think I would favor Jamal Adams a little bit more than Chris Jones because of need, but I think Chris Jones is a better player. Um, so it, that would be a tough decision to make, but if the Dolphins did make that decision to get Chris Jones and give up the Texans or their or the Dolphins, um, whichever one they want to give up, whichever one of the two first-round picks they want to give up, I would not be mad at that at all because Chris Jones is a great player uh, and uh, would be amazing to have on the team. One, would be one of the, we would have one of the best defensive linemen in the NFL uh, to match that up with one of the best secondaries in the NFL, which would be pretty, pretty awesome. Um, so let's move on from that. Uh, and I got a little list together. So this is, I wanted to talk about this because there's nothing really to talk about. So I, I kind of have to go, you know, find things to talk about that are interesting too, obviously, regarding the Dolphins. And I wanted to look at free agency and really talk about maybe some additions the Dolphins could make, um, who are still out there that are maybe fly under the radar a little bit. Uh, so I wanted to bring a few names up that you might have skipped your mind, but you, you know, and you forget that they're uh, still out there. So, Delaney Walker is one of the players that immediately, I, I was like, yeah, I could see that being a good veteran signing for the Dolphins. Definitely a better version of Dwayne Allen, and you know, obviously that experiment never really worked, um, but Delaney Walker brings a great run blocking presence, savvy veteran, could give us like production like Antonio Gates did towards the end of his career, where he's really just a third down guy. Could be a first because Delaney's a better run blocker than Antonio Gates was, so you can use him in different areas more. But I think you're getting a way better version of Dwayne Allen, um, way better version. So I think Delaney Walker. I know he's had some injuries, and especially since his advanced age, kind of hurt him. But I still think he could be a nice asset for the Dolphins, and he should be super cheap as well. So that'd be a nice veteran signing for them. I think you know a few people forget that he's out there. Jason Peters, I've said this in the past in the last episode, would be a great signing for the Dolphins. Great mentor to Austin Jackson, similar to what Brandon Albert was to uh, Laramie Tunsil, and I feel like that could be a pretty nice addition as well. Uh, some other names here, uh, I think Cam Wake, but we talked about that last week, so I, I wouldn't uh, you know necessarily go down that road again. Um, I have a few other names here if this list thing would load here. Logan Ryan is somebody we talked about a lot. Um, I think he would be a great signing for the Dolphins. And uh, for a lot of different reasons. I think he's not the same player he used to be. I think, when, you know, he's not the New England Patriots, Logan Ryan. You saw a little bit of that last year. I think at best he's a great two. Uh, he's a great two at his best at this point. Um, but... I don't think that's the reason the Dolphins are going to sign him. I think the reason they're going to sign him is he can play safety. And he knows the system because he played in it for a long time. And, you know, obviously that would bring... That would be awesome to get a vet player who's really good and fills a hole, by the way, at free safety, uh, who could bring experience to that position and knows the system in and out on a shortened season where they're not really going to get game action this year. You know, obviously preseason is... I think, I mean, they're still, we still haven't heard, but I know they dwindled it down to two games, but it might not even happen. Um, so that could be a valuable asset as well, just because he knows the system, lack of practice time, stuff of that nature. Uh, and he's a good veteran player. I think Luke and Ryan could be one of the better signings the Dolphins can make. Um, as for some other names, I think those guys are really the guys that really stand out to me. Um, there's no one else that really... You know, some other position players that you guys might bring up. Tony Jefferson, I just don't feel like he fits the system. He's a box safety. He can't really cover that well. Um, you know, there's some older tackles out there. I just don't feel like they're good fits. Because at that point, I just would want Austin Jackson to get reps. Um, you know, Josh Gordon wouldn't kind of be a little bit of a repetitive thing. Road to go down because I think we have better versions of him right now. We've got two really good outside receivers that could do a lot of different things. Um, so there's really no room for him. So yeah, that pretty much wraps up. Uh, I think Clowney's just, you know, I think he's just going to cost too much. And um, I, I think we've already sell that, you know, we've kind of passed that bridge already. But yeah, so some of the guys that I just brought up, uh, Delaney Walker, Logan Ryan, uh, 
who else did I bring up? Oh, yeah, Jason Peters. I think Cam Wake. I think those are the guys that I really would look at as potential free agent signings that are, could fit in the price range uh, and could help the Dolphins in a big way. And we talked about Cam Wake last week, so we don't really have to talk about that. But Cam Wake could just be a nice little uh, homecoming and could be a really good third-down guy for us, you know, for I think, you know, not just this year but next year. I think he still has a lot left in the tank. All right, hopefully that wasn't too rambly. But now that we're past the remaining free agents of the 2020 class, I want to move on. Obviously, it's very hard to find any news. I want to move on to the 2021 NFL free agency class. So I've tried to look up uh, cap figures for 2021, and I really didn't get a good... I mean, it's hard to because we don't know exactly what the cap is going to be. Um, but the Dolphins are still projected to be in Tier 1 of the 2021 free agency cap health, according to OverTheCap.com. So we're still going to have... Uh, or projected to have a pretty, you know, good amount of cap space left. And I really wanted to look at the 2021 uh, class and really just bring up a couple of players that I think could be on the Dolphins' radar. And depending on how things go, like, I can't see the future, because some of these guys might be eliminated from that. Um, so I wanted to get into that really quick. So some of the big names for tackle, in case some of the tackle, you know, Jesse Davis doesn't work out, maybe Austin Jackson just needs another year to develop, and they just want to throw someone in there that... Uh, can give who's got great experience and can really play better to give Tua a good head start to his career in case Austin Jackson just isn't quite ready yet. So I looked at the tackle positions and some of the names that stood out to me is Alejandro Villanueva, the tackle from the Titans, David Bottiari uh, for the Green Bay Packers, Taylor Decker from the Detroit Lions. All could be really good young um, tackles for the Dolphins to take a look at. And especially since, you know, you want to surround two with them as much talent as you can. And uh, I think if the tackle stuff doesn't work out, and maybe, and like I said, Austin Jackson needs maybe another year to develop, you kind of get the trains, uh, the wheels on the train going a little bit by signing some veteran tackles. And those two right there, I mean, Taylor Decker, Batiari, and Villanueva, all really good players and could help right away. Then I looked at edge, in case maybe the Dolphins are a little bit unsatisfied with their pass rush side of things, even though I... I think if you look at the New England method, they really don't invest in that too much, and it still works for them. And I know, and we saw that with their free agency strategy that they're kind of going that way as well to really fortify the secondary. But I feel like I still wanted to look at some of the edge players just in case that someone popped out uh, to me. And the, the player that popped out to me immediately was Joey Bosa and Melvin Ingram. So they can't pay both of them. And they're going to have to let one of those guys go, I would suspect. Plus, I don't think the Chargers, Los Angeles Chargers, are going to have that great of a season. I know that's very controversial. I just don't trust their quarterbacks all that much. Um, and they're in a very tough division. So I don't think that that season's going to go all too well. So I can see maybe they are content with letting these one of these two go, even though it's their best. Those are like the two of their best players on their team. And the one that I could see going out of all of out of the two is definitely Melvin Ingram. He's older. Uh, Joey's younger. I think Melvin. This would be Melvin's third contract. I, I I think, and obviously Joey's going into his second. Now, who's the better pass rusher out of the two? It's no contest. Joey Bosa. I think Melvin is a better athlete and he's more versatile though, and I think he fits the system of the Dolphins significantly more. And I think he's the most likely to be let go. So I could see Melvin being a high priority free agent for the Dolphins. You know, they they went after Clowney, and Melvin has a similar game to Clowney's. You know, he's not this big physical guy, but he's a very versatile player. He can play with his hand in the dirt inside and outside, and he can you can stand him up. You can play him at middle linebacker, which he does a lot for the for the for the Chargers. He is a perfect fit for the Dolphins and what they like to do to have versatile chess pieces and matchup problems they can create for opposing offenses. Melvin Ingram is the perfect fit. Plus, he's not just a pass rusher. He's a great run defender as well. And I feel like that would be a perfect fit for Brian Flores' system. Uh, and I think that's someone to keep your eye on for next year is Melvin Ingram. Uh, and again, this is the 2021 class. Uh, those two, the, the tackles and defensive ends are the really ones, uh, are the only ones that I really looked into. Everything else, I think they could address in the draft. Um, with some of the younger players, like if the safety position doesn't work out, they could go there. They could go with a veteran there, uh, but they're, you know, who knows really what they're going to do in the secondary. I think there's some good secondary players that they could look at uh, in the draft. So, and there's not really too many big names that I 
love in this upcoming free agency class. Uh, I think the best one is Buda Baker from Arizona, but I don't expect him to leave Arizona. I could see, obviously, he's coming off of his rookie deal, so I would not be surprised if he just got locked up. So, yeah, those are the only guys that I really stood out to me were the, you know, Taylor Decker, Bottiari, uh, Villanueva, and Melvin Ingram, I think, would be the the jewel on the crown if we were able to, to, to get him because I think he's such a perfect fit for the team. And, you know, he was rumored, like, I think whenever his contract up was previous, the previous time, heavily rumored to be a Dolphin. And I know he said, it, I don't know if it was true or not, but I remember reading a quote where he was like, I would love to play for the Dolphins. So maybe it was meant to be. Uh, and he's still a young player at that in the, at that point in time. Perfect for, for the defense. He could add a great amount of pass rush, and he's just all around really good player. And I think he would fit very well in the system. Um, so, yeah, I think Melvin Ingram would be a great addition to the team uh, for the if the Dolphins choose to do that in 2021. And obviously they could afford him as well. And that's obviously if the pat if if they if they're like all right maybe we need a little bit more juice up front I think they could they could go that route for sure, but the Dolphins are definitely doing a great job of building it the New England way and I love if you compare the two between Miami and Detroit because there's obviously two very heavy New England uh, staffs with GM ties and head coach ties for both teams. Um, you could see how they built the teams differently. Uh, Brian Flores and Chris Greer prioritized secondary. Uh, I can't remember, I think it was his name, Bob Quinn. What is his name, the GM for the Lions? I can't remember right now. Obviously, Matt Patricia. Early on, there was a lot of upfront signings. You had Damon Harrison, which they made a move. Um, Trey Flowers, who they paid a lot of money to. Um, obviously, they, they you know, as time went on, they ch- kind of changed that up. They, you know, they, they went out and got Okuda uh, and uh, Desmond Trufant. And they traded away their best uh, safety at the time. Uh, to Seattle, so they really haven't prioritized secondary as much as they prioritize the defensive line and even linebackers. They drafted what's his face, Jared Davis, out of Florida. I think that was his first pick. So they really prioritized um, the front seven, and I think what you see what the Dolphins did, uh, they really prioritized secondary with their free agency moves and even in the draft. So you can see how they kind of went in different directions there, and I think the Lions were trying to revert back to that, even though the Dolphins really built that foundation here. And are continuing to build off of that, which which I think is just an interesting look at the two. Uh, and I don't really know. I, uh, I I don't know why I brought that up, <laughs> but I I think I think that my point is is you could see how different the philosophies are, even though they they came from. And I think the Dolphins are doing it the right way. And we were talking about defensive line um, men, and that's why I was bringing up the Dolphins don't prioritize that as much as secondary. And you can see how that's worked for New England. And you can see how it's kind of not worked for Detroit because Trey Flowers was a New England type of a defensive lineman, and he just didn't have that much of an impact because, one, he didn't have a great secondary behind him, uh, and it just wasn't the same. And that really affected his game uh, and how that line's defense was able to play. And I think the Dolphins, first and foremost, is like, we have to build the secondary. And thank God they had Xavier and Howard when Brian Flores got here. Um, obviously, I know the Dolphins, we all know they picked Christian Wilkins. Uh, but you can see with what you know, all the assets they acquired for the, the biggest draft uh, that they had, they really went secondary heavy with free agency and uh, with the draft. And they did a really good job of getting undrafted young guys uh, and some later round guys uh, and really molded them really nicely like Nick Dean into, into the secondary last year. So I, I just love what the what the team's doing and what they're going to be doing going forward. So let's, let's go into the fan community where we answer fans' questions. Favorite segment of the show. Again, this could be a shorter episode. Not really anything I can, you know, uh, there's not a lot I can do about that. There's just not a lot to talk about. Um, there's just really not a lot to talk about right now. I mean, if you look at debate shows and sports shows, I mean, they have literally 50 different Cam Newton topics. I mean, that's how bad it is. It's like, how many times are we going to talk about Cam Newton going to the to the Patriots in different ways? Oh, okay. well, Bill Belichick let him do the Superman celebration. I mean, that is how slow we have hit the bottom of the ocean on, on topics to talk about. Um, so let's get into the fan community where we answer fans' questions. Uh, this first question comes from William. He says, hey, Skaggs, long-time listener and first-time commentator. I really, really appreciate that. He also says, love the show. I uh, really appreciate that as well, William. Uh, he says, now that there's two mobile quarterbacks in the AFC East, what defensive strategies can we implement that will be most effective against the Patriots and Bills. Also, what players will help the most against those quarterbacks? 
So this is a great question. Immediately when we made the decision, and I didn't think we were going to do this, but we invested, and you, I mean, I was shocked that Byron Jones, I, like as soon as I heard the news, I was like, oh my God, I didn't think the Dolphins, one, were going to be able to get him, and two, I didn't think they were going to invest in him. Uh, and I was, you know, it shocked me. Uh, I'm losing my train of thought here. Um, okay, so as soon as we made that move, the the thing I, f I first thought about, since we play obviously 95% man is what we played last year, I expect that to go up another 5%. Um, that's a bad matchup for Josh Allen and the Buffalo Bills because Josh Allen, what he doesn't do well is pass from the pocket. He's very inaccurate. Um, and that is something that he's obviously have to work. He's going to have to work on, uh, but intermediate stuff, all that stuff. He's just very inaccurate and inconsistent. I mean, people say he improved last year, which he did, but he still missed a lot of passes. Um, and trust me, as a Dolphins fan, it's frustrating playing him, especially the last two years. Um, I think we've only beat him once in two years. It's, you know, he's just not a very good pocket passer, and he obviously struggles with accuracy. Now, Cam Newton's weakest part of his game, even though I think he's a better pocket passer than Josh Allen, his weakest part of his game is his accuracy and his consistency being accurate. When you play tight man-to-man -man coverage, that's Tom Brady's kryptonite. That was the, you can't play zone, it'll dice you up. You have to have great athletes and great cornerbacks to match up with these guys, and especially if that's Tom Brady's kryptonite, I feel like it's a very, very it's gonna be very tough for both of those guys to pass against the way we play defense and um, the talent that we have in the secondary. I think it's a bad matchup for them. So to answer your question, who do I think? What players do I think are gonna affect those two mobile cornerbacks the most? I think it's definitely the corners because I feel like it's a bad matchup for them. And if you play uh, disciplined football, which is what this defense does, especially towards the end of last year, and Brian Flores will have these boys ready, they'll have the rush lanes together. They'll make sure, and I'm sure they'll have a great game plan, especially up front, to keep the quarterback in the pocket and make him beat us in the pocket. And if we can do that, then it's going to be a terrible matchup for them because they don't have uh, the skills to really overcome that. And especially New England, who just doesn't have anybody to throw to, uh, it, it's kind of it's going to be tough. And when you look at, and I think people have brought this up before, but Edelman, the best thing he does is timing and short stuff. And, and again, I think Cam Newton is one of the better pocket passers in the National Football League. I just think he's his accuracy is inconsistent. Um, and I think it's the worst part of his game is definitely his accuracy. And same thing with Josh Allen. I think the worst part of his game is accuracy, and especially consistency over an entire football game is a very big problem of his. So if you could just keep... And it's not easy to say this because two, those two guys are very good at what they do in terms of getting out of the pocket and making plays. But if you can keep them in the pocket and you're disciplined, and you have a great game plan, and you have a good coaching staff, and make them throw within the pocket against how we play defense, it's going to be a tough, tough, tough time for them because we're not going to give you easy throws in zone coverage. You're going to have to make tight, accurate throws on a consistent basis with Byron Jones and Xavier Howard on the outside, and we're just in your grill. And uh, so it's going to be a tough, tough, and especially with X's ball skills. Like, if I was an offensive coordinator going against our team, it would be it's going to be tough. I mean, X can make a play on the ball and change a game. And Byron just doesn't let anybody get open. So it's 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 going to be a tough, tough, tough go for them, I feel like. Uh, and plus, we got way more athletic up front. So I think all of those things, and like I said, the first thing I thought of when we got Byron Jones was, man, I think we can really match up against the Bills way better than we did a year ago. Uh, so I, I think that's what I, I think my answer to your question, William. This next question comes from Chip. He says, if Cam isn't 100%, do you think that spells trouble... Or excuse me, he says, if Cam isn't 100%, do you think that spells trouble for Miami? Or even another title AFC... Or will it be another... Uh, excuse me. I'm sorry, Chip. I'm messing up your question. He says, if Cam is 100%, do you think that spells trouble for Miami? Or even another title... AFC East title for New England? Or even another AFC East title for New England? He had title in there twice. It was mess messing me up. Uh, and that's just my, it's not your fault, Chip. My fault. Dumb can't read. Anyway, moving on to Chip's question. Yes, it makes it a thousand times harder to win the AFC East than, a befo uh, than before it did. I mean, Cam Newton is a very good quarterback. And 
I know a lot of people disagree with me on this, but I really do believe this. He is a really good quarterback. So yes, if you add a better quarterback to a New England culture and a New England um, system and Josh McDaniels and all that other stuff, of course it's going to be di- more difficult. I would definitely rather... And, I, and if I asked you guys who would you rather play, Jarrett Stidham or Cam Newton twice a year, overwhelmingly it would be Jarrett Stidham. If I asked you who do you want to play more, Sam Darnold or Cam Newton twice a year, overwhelming, overwhelmingly you would rather play Sam Darnold. Uh, now the Josh Allen thing, I think you guys could get crazy on that. I would rather play Josh Allen personally. Um... I think Cam's a better player, but it just makes it that much harder to win. Now, I think we're going in the right direction. What we're building here is special, and if you're building something special, you can contend for titles in any division. You just have to build the right team, and I feel like the Dolphins are doing that, and I really do believe in this coaching staff, and I believe in you know the direction that they're going in. So I think we're going to make it just as tough on everybody else, and Obviously, it's still a drop-off. Brady is still one of the best quarterbacks of all time. You know, Cam isn't Tom Brady level. Uh, so, it's still a drop-off there. And they're going to have to... We're gonna, it's going to be interesting to see how they switch around the offense. And just one more little tidbit on the Cam Newton situation. I've heard a lot of people say they're going to change the offense for Cam Newton. I'm not trying... Because I've watched Cam Newton since he... Pretty much every snap since he was drafted. If, if my brother is a Panthers fan. I've watched many games with him. How that happened? It's a whole. It's a. It's a different. You know. It's a different conversation. Anyway, the point is, Trader brother is a Panthers fan, and one of the things we've I've noticed, especially when North Turner became the offensive coordinator for Carolina, he, they really took a step back with all the because obviously he had a lot of injury issues. They changed the offense. What Cam? The offense that Cam was running. I don't know if it's it's different coordinators, but it's this is still my point. They didn't run him as much. And he couldn't run as much. And he lost a lot of his physicality. You know, he went vegan and all this other stuff. And you could tell he wasn't the same Cam Newton. He wasn't the same guy who was bouncing off of linebackers. You know, he was easier to tackle. He was easier to sack. You know, he, he had a lot of issues. So I don't necessarily think... I don't know where Cam is at his state of his career. I know he's healthier. I don't know if he's going to ever still be the guy that's going to lead... You know, lead... Uh, have more rushing touchdowns in the decade than Marshawn Lynch did. I mean, that's what Cam Newton was doing. I don't know if he's that guy anymore. And you definitely can't sustain that until 40. I want to reiterate that as well. We've seen the toll it takes on Cam Newton to carry an entire fo- football team, and you treat him like a running back, you, you, you're just not going to last as long. So I don't know if how much they're going to be have to do that and if he can last the entire season. I, I really do question that because, you know, it's not 2011 anymore. He's a veteran player. And he has lost weight now. Recently, when you've seen him, he's definitely gained weight weight from last year. It's gonna be. I just. I feel like. I just don't think you can use like Cam Newton like he used to be able to. And I and I still think Cam's deadly from the pocket, but I, I just don't think you can use him like uh, you used to. And I think this whole thing with Josh McDaniels, you know, changing the the team to look more like maybe like a Tim Tebow Broncos team. I just don't think Cam can do that anymore. Uh, and, and my, and not as much as he... I think he can still do some of that stuff, but I just don't think he can do the quarterback power stuff 10 times a game like he used to. Now, can he roll out of the pocket and get you 15, 25? Yeah, he can definitely still do that. But is he, the you know, from the 10-yard line going to take on three linebackers and drag him to the end zone anymore? I just don't think he... Or they really want to put him in, the, in those situations as much. All right, this is, great. This is a good question by Chip. Interesting conversation to have with Cam Newton, but uh, so moving on from Chip's question, and I think we answered his question. Um, yeah, uh, this next question comes from Douglas. He says, "Hey Skags, what are your thoughts on Isaiah Ford? I thought he played really well last year, and I'd like to him to be uh, the first man if either Jakeem Grant or Wilson get hurt again." Yeah, I love Isaiah Ford. He really fit the system with all the option routes and stuff of that nature uh, in Chad 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 O'Shea system. He really did a really good job. And he's a good athlete, too. People forget about that. He's an explosive athlete. He's a bigger slot receiver, too. He's a great route runner. I think Isaiah Ford has a real future in this offense. You know, he had, like, what? I think he had 90 yards his first game starting. And he wasn't even starting the game at the beginning of the game against the Jets. He just came in. And I was really questioning... You know, at the, as soon as Devontae left, I was like, oh, man, it's going to be tough. And Isaiah Ford really did a great job of, you know, carrying the offense. And when you, when you saw the game in Cincinnati, which is another big game that he had, 
uh, he dominated into that game as well. So I really like Isaiah Ford. I think he, um, again, he brings great route running, bigger slot receiver as well, and he's pretty good after the catch. People forget explosive. He's more explosive than you think. He's not as explosive as Jakeem and Albert Wilson, but I think his game fits the slot position a little bit better than those two. Uh, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if Albert Wilson was getting a serious playing time and if he, if he was uh, competing for that. Cause Albert, not Albert Wilson, Isaiah Ford is who I'm talking about. Isaiah, I wouldn't be surprised if Isaiah Ford got serious playing time. Hopefully I didn't mix those two names up the entire time. I was talking about Isaiah Ford when I was talking about explosive, explosiveness, route running, and stuff of that nature. But it's going to be tough because Albert Wilson, he looked really good at the end of last year to answer your question, Douglas. It's going to be a tough, tough go, but I think Isaiah Ford could definitely be contending for a serious playing time, not just like the fourth or fifth receiver on the team. Uh, this next question comes from SM. He says, thoughts on Jimmy Johnson going to the NFL Hall of Fame of Class of 2020? He deserves it. He was the architect of that Cowboys team. Everybody gives him credit for it. Uh, he came up with the draft system. Um, you know, he's a really one of the revolutionary coaches uh, in NFL history. And everywhere he went, you know, everybody won. And even when he was the Dolphins coach, obviously he wasn't as successful. Uh, but he still went to the playoff games. He still won. When he was in Dallas, obviously, Super Bowl champions. And when he was in a hurricane, obviously, national champions. So uh, there you go. Uh, let's see here. Douglas, this next question comes from Douglas. He said, uh, hey, Skaggs, what does the 1383 stand for and mean after your name? Is it Marino to Clayton? You know what? You got You know what? The co- I think someone asked this question before. Uh... And you might be right. I'm just going to leave it at that. This next question comes from Ethan. He says, Hey, Skaggs, will the lack of a preseason benefit the Dolphins because Fitzy knows our system or hurt our chances of success this year? Uh, I think it's kind of a little bit of both, but reps are important. And, it's, and I think it hurts the Dolphins more than it helps them. Even though Fitzy knows the, the system, the rest of the guys don't. Uh, and the offensive line is the thing I'm most worried about. I really would love for them to... And, you know, this is something I've talked about with the Dolphins for a long time. The last 10 years of Dolphins football, I would say... I'll put it this way. Since Joe Philbin on, they've done a lot of cross-training with their offensive line, and I've always been against that. Uh, I, I, You know, I think it's... I think you should train the same guys. Get an idea for who do you think is going to be best here, here, and here. You already have an idea, especially as a veteran offensive lineman, you already know if they can play other positions, because I'm sure they've done that on a different team. I just have never liked the cross-training stuff, and I've always been a, the guy who's like, get the best guys together and let them play together, because all offensive linemen ever talk about is chemistry matters the most, communication is the most important, Playing, knowing where, what this guy likes to do, what this guy likes to do is the most important thing when it comes to getting being able to have a great offensive line. And obviously talent plays a factor into that too. But the whole cross-training thing where one guy is playing left tackle and then he's playing guard and he's playing center, like I've never liked that and it's never worked for this team. So I just, I hope that we don't have su- super short season and, or off season. I don't know. I guess, I mean, we're definitely going to have that. It just sucks for the offensive line because these guys haven't played together and, uh, I would really love it for those guys to kind of come together and gel. So I think it, it kind of hurts the Dolphins in a big way, especially on the offensive line, to answer your question, Ethan. Uh, this next, and it sucks to say that, but it's true. This next question comes from Adrian. He says, Skaggs, what one player on offense or defense? Again, this comes from Adrian. What one player on offense or defense that is available now, trade or expected to be cut, or cut down casualty, would you like to sign? I'm one of those people that feel that the team needs an upgrade at running back. However, defensive end and free safety could be looked at. What do you say? So, okay, off, uh, is available for trade or expected cut down casualty? Who, who would you like to sign? I think right now, as a, a priority, I think I have to take a serious look at Logan Ryan. <clears throat> and obviously the Jets would never trade me Jamal Adams. But if I had a – one thing I would do if I was the Dolphins right now was get Jamal Adams. Um, I love Chris Jones. I just think Jamal fits such a need for this team, and he fits it so well that I think I would. I think Jamal Adams would be a priority. So if I had to trade, it would be definitely for Jamal Adams. If I had to sign someone, and it's not, it's definitely not a cut down casualty, <clears throat> or it's like they're trying to get cap space, all that, none of that. If it's a veteran player in camp, and they you know, maybe like someone young that got cut that they like, they want to get rid of a vet. I don't really see anything like that. I think. 
if I had to sign anybody right now, it would probably be Logan Ryan. I think he would be, a, or Jason Peters. I think those two would be great additions to the team, um, for sure. Uh, to answer your question, Adrian. Uh, this next question comes from Kid or K I D. Uh, he says, "Fins up, Skags. I'd like to hear your opinion on tight end David and Joku. He has requested a trade from the Cleveland Browns, and I think he." Uh, so he says, I think we wouldn't have to part with much, maybe a fourth or a fifth, at least to get another young guy to compete with. So I, I've thought about this Njoku thing a lot. I mean, yeah, it would be a great addition to the team. You know, we could run a lot of two tight end sets. Njoku's had a lot of injury issues in the past, though. And I think Mike Gesicki is a better receiving tight end than Njoku is right now. That's just my opinion. But Njoku, athletic freak, big physical guy, still has a ton of upside. I think that would be an interesting move for the Dolphins to make. It doesn't necessarily fill a huge hole, because I think Gesicki, especially in the spread offense, fits the scheme pretty well. But if the Dolphins want to do some two tight end set stuff, I wouldn't be too, completely against it. Um, and I don't think, like, I think you, what you say here, uh, uh, kid, is... They wouldn't have to part uh, with much to get him. So yeah, I, I mean, I, even, I think a fourth and a fifth might be a little high, but I could see, I could see that. Uh, this next question comes from Hunter. He says, "Do you think Preston and Devonte can get over a thousand yards receiving?" It's, so this is very difficult to do, <laughs> like very difficult to do if you look at the history of the league. Uh, so I don't know if it's going to be that prolific. I could see it happening one day, um, and we'll see how good Preston Williams is this year. Uh, coming off that injury, but they're very talented guys. Both of them are definitely going to have a thousand yards at some. I mean, uh, DP had it last year. Preston's going to have it one year, so it could be in the same year. But it's very difficult to do. It's very difficult to do. Now, if the offensive line is great or good, and it's way better than it was last year, they have a way way better chance of doing it because you can make more plays, more broken plays, stuff of that nature. I think it all depends on the offensive line. So, I don't know. That one's kind of up in the air, but I would say this to answer your question, Hunter. They both have the talent to go over 1,000 yards. That's for sure. Uh, this next question comes from SM. He says, any free agents you would kick the tires on? Lamar Miller, Charles Clay, Clowney, Deion Jordan. So, to answer your question, SM, no. None of those guys. I mean, Clowney, is, you know, the ship has sailed on that one. He's already turned down the deal that we gave him at the start of the year. I don't think he's ever going to come back on anything else. Uh, so yeah, the whole Lamar, and Lamar, you know, I feel like Brita and Howard are better at this point in their career. Clay, uh, just don't really know what he would do on the offense. Uh, and obviously Deion Jordan is Deion Jordan. Uh, the sixth question, question comes from Pablo. He says, do you think we will see a Taysom Hill sort of approach with Malcolm Perry? If not, where and when do you think he will be used? Okay, so yes, I think the approach will be similar where you kind of just want to get him the ball any way you, you can but he's not going to be playing tight end he's not going to be playing you know taking handoffs he's not going to be blocking punts he's just not that big of a dude Taysom Hill is a physical big dude okay okay Malcolm is a smaller guy obviously but he's an explosive guy he's like a mini Darren Sproles you know very versatile guy you know hopefully we cross train him to play slot sometimes I think that would be you know beneficial to the team in the future but I think Yes, the Taysom Hill approach is definitely something the Dolphins should take with him and just really get get him in the open field as much as they can. So, And I've said that a million times, but I, th I think it's uh, a very explosive player and uh, would be really fun to watch. There's your question, Pablo. Uh, the next question comes from Nothing Face. He says, Hey, Skaggs, do you play fantasy football? If so, what, uh, what Dolphins do you think will bring their team owners the most fantasy points this year? I think it would be cool if maybe you did a fantasy football episode. I've made some really good sleeper picks the last couple of years, picking up some rookies. You really hyped up before the draft that you were hoping Miami would take. Um, so wait, is this a compliment towards me? He says, I've made some really good sleeper picks the last couple of years, uh, picking up some rookies that you really hyped up before the draft that you were hoping Miami would take. I appreciate that, no face, dude. Um, you remind me of the guy at the Justice League that I can't remember now. That's all I picture right now. But anyway, the point is, imagine him telling, asking me this question. Uh, uh, the question, so I don't play fantasy football. I've tried many times, just can never really get into it. Um, but it's, I appreciate the compliment, if that is a compliment. Uh, you know, we've missed some guys that I love, let's be honest. Uh, but, you know, we've definitely hit on some, especially... Um, 
these last few years that I'd even know it would be hits. So, yeah, but I really appreciate that for sure. I think I would be good at fantasy football, but I just I just never got past. Like, I would draft my team and then stop immediately after that. Uh, this next question comes from Richard. He says, there will be no football in 2020. Richard, you're being a, a negative Nancy, uh, and you've been a little bit cynical right now, and I need you to calm down. All right, Richard. When we hit the nuclear red button and there will be no football... As, when the NFL comes out and says, then hit it, Richard, okay? But we're not putting that out there right now. We're not putting that out there. Too many negative lives. Now, you have college football, probably in a limited... limited. Th- I don't care about college football, though. I could care less, and I've said this many times. could care less about college football. I love the game of college football, but the it's really just four teams every year, and all the other teams, they're like, all right, this is... If they have a great quarterback, then it's f- more fun to watch, but most of the teams suck, so I'm like, I don't, I don't care. I don't, I'm not... Why, you know, I've, I watch enough NFL games on Sunday to be, and Monday and Thursday to be, you know, co- college football. Just, I, you know, just it is. On the, I'm just saying, if we lost NFL football, I'd be way more distraught about it. So don't hit the panic button, Richard. Not yet. I don't think it's time to hit the panic button just yet. So that is going to be it, guys. That is it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed. We almost made it an hour, but we couldn't do it because, you know, there's not a lot to talk about. But. I think this is a longer episode than the last two. I think we talked about all the cool cool stuff, brought up a lot of interesting topics. Hopefully you guys enjoyed, and can't wait to see you guys in the next one.